Just bring me some cereal. That cereal is full of unhealthy ingredients. I threw it away. Don't throw away my stuff. Frank, that cereal is for children. Enjoy this grapefruit. You're for children, stupid. Today we're going to start a garden. Oh, fuck this shit. Woohoo! Hello, it's the big 3-0, 3-0, episode 30. Episode the, 30. The podcast that eats free shredded wheat. <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't know if we ever thought we would get to episode 30. I don't remember, you know, 30 seems so far off in our lives, I think, didn't it? Yeah, I didn't think I'd ever get to 30. No, but here we are. That was 11 years ago. Uh, 11 long, hard, difficult years of degenerating. Uh, we'll be talking about ageing a lot and uh, emotions, poignancy... Um, where you go in life, I think when you get on, we get onto a showcase this this episode, which is of course is Robot and Frank, which is I think um, a small film. I don't know if it's probably smaller than Ex Machina. I don't know how many of our listeners have actually seen it, but yeah, it's a nice little film. Mm, yeah, I mean, there's quite a lot we can talk about on that, but like you say, it's a lovely little charming film. It's just the two of us this week. It's just myself and Mark, the um, the uh, I don't know the dynamic duo. Yep, pulls away camping. We haven't got the terrible trio. <laughs> well, we'll 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 uh we'll hodgepodge and bodge our way through the Star Wars segment, really, which is more than just this more Rogue One stuff, really, isn't it? Yeah. Nothing too nothing too weighty there. Um, let's see what else we got for housekeeping. We're looking into having our audio podcast published on our YouTube channel. Yeah, you mentioned that this week. Yeah, I mean we've got to sit down and work out what we do. I mean you kind of set up the YouTube channel. I think we need to, I don't know, confirm our account or some verify our account. Something yep. like is it worded as You're verified? Yeah. To get in order to get our podcasts to play because your new YouTube accounts will only accept video files of a certain of a certain length, and we need to verify our account to uh, to open that up so that we can put podcasts on of any length. Um, that will be an automatic thing that will work from the feed once it's set up we won't have to do anything else from that um, basically all it will be whatever album or cover art which is specific to that episode not our generic cover art but to specific to that episode will come up there's a picture on the screen and you will get the audio from the podcast playing right. in the background so once we've got that set up and work and that's how it goes but like I said we need to look into that and um, see how it goes also uh Smiley Jim, who provided us with our local news intro music. Which, a wonderful jingle, yeah. Yeah, has has been at it again. He's um he's uh he's got his guitar out and he's recorded us a little ditty he calls not a ditty, he's not a song, but a little a little tune called John Williams Wampa. And it's it's basically um elements of the Star Wars theme played on the electric guitar, isn't it? And we can use that in future, I think, to introduce our Star Wars segment, can't yeah, we? So yeah. thanks to Jim for that again. Yeah, thanks Jim. That's a nice little Easter egg we didn't think we'd get, but we're certainly grateful and we can certainly use that. Yeah, and, definitely. Uh, you know, it gives the podcast, I think, more of a more of a uniformed, rounded out sort of feel, I think. Um, we've got some more sound clips come back in. I, I think a lot of our listeners are glad to know we've got the return of Yarrick. Yeah, Yarrick is clips. back. Yarrick <laughs> is back and uh, he, he's not mucking about, as you will get to hear for yourself. And that's about it, really, for housekeeping. Well, I don't personally have anything else, do you? Well, just a few bits and pieces. I mean, um, we, we spoke about uh, Anton Yelchin's death. Uh, that's right. Uh, young Chekhov um, in the Star Trek reboots. Uh, sadly died um, last week. And, um, yeah, we've had, we had quite a few uh, tributes to him on our, um, on our Facebook page. So thanks very much, uh, you know, for uh, contributing and a very sad passing. Obviously, the Star Trek Beyond movie comes out next month, so um, I understand they have dedicated the movie to him. Um, I've been fairly impressed by the recent Star Trek films. I must admit. I mean, I'm not a big Trekkie, but um, you know, I think I think the director J J Abrams did a great job in the first one. So <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think Star Trek is such an expansive universe. There's so many series, so many movies books tie-ins I mean the, the Star Trek franchise is very strong and it's got quite a large opinionated and passionate fan base yeah so to take it and to a degree reinvent it and make it relevant in the way he did and like you say I think he made it he's made it work he, he, and I mean similar to what that people have said about The Force Awakens he's very good at remixing films you know and mm. I think that's what he'd done with, with both the first 
you know, the two first uh, Star Trek films, you know, the stories were kind of inverted yeah. uh, on the originals. So, um, yeah, but uh, sad sad about uh, Anton Neochin's passing, you know, uh, 27. No Which age. is nothing. No, and, uh, you know, I understand he was a kind, generous man and uh, had quite a future in, um, in acting, really. So, uh, yeah, um, thoughts are with his family and uh, fans, obviously, so... Mm, definitely I mean um, we, we did make the offer of anyone who wanted to send their own tributes we'd be prepared to either play or read them out but um, mm -hmm. nobody's taken us up on that but I think everyone's still you know it's it, it, it it's, it's a sad pass and it's like only 27 um, bizarre circumstances he passed away and you know it doesn't sound like it was some sort of self-induced misadventure just basically no. a freak accident yeah yeah you know, and um, yeah, certainly our thoughts are with uh, thinking of him and his family and his friends I mm -hmm. think, and the Star Trek community because they are a passionate community that does like look after their own and yeah, a very sad time. So, um, in other news, um, 19th and 20th and 21st of August in Cambridge, we have the Cambridge B Movie Festival coming up again. Uh, I'm not sure how many they've ever had now, maybe, maybe three or four, but um. You know, they're, they're taking over the leisure park, basically, and sh showing right. some awful films, some great films, some tacky films, but all of them have some interesting elements, and I mean, that's the whole idea, that they get people, you know, remember those VHS cassettes you would rent, and it would be a terrible film, straight to video, something like that, you know, mm -hmm. fun, but, you know, one of the films they're showing, actually, is... Uh, Masters of the Universe, which is quite relevant. With, Not the uh, Dolph Lundgren one. That's right. And Frank, oh no, where's the market for that? I know. And Frank Langella, who is a star of robot, and Frank was of course Skeletor in that film. So, yeah. <laughs> so there's a link there already. So, but I think it'd be a good. You can buy like a a, a day ticket or a, a ticket for the whole weekend, and uh, you know if you like your movies, you like to have a laugh, get down there with your friends, and I'm sure it'd be good good fun. So. Yeah, I'm sure it will be. Oh, God. By the power of grey skull, hey? Yep. <laughs> um, also, um, next month, uh, we're obviously going to Star Wars Celebration, which uh, we're looking forward to. I understand that they've got the uh, floor plans and that release now, Dave, saying where different things yes. are happening. Um, so, um, yeah, look out for us um, down there. I've got our new Hot One Per T-shirts, and I forgot to bring them, Dave, but um, I can drop them around later for... Uh, if you want to model them, I don't know. <laughs> I've got two large and one medium, which is a bit of a scary thing because I've tried to slip into the medium and I realised that, you know, I've got a month or so to lose a bit of weight. <laughs> so, so shoe on me in, mate. I might need to talc myself up in that one. Or well, put on a wetsuit or it something. Will be, have to yeah. peel it off, yeah. Yeah, I will be smuggling peanuts, I'm sure. <laughs> Help you get it out. It's not too bad in the Excel Centre, mate, for when we go there. It's quite comfortable. Is it, it aircon, is it? Yeah. I can't remember. I think it was July when me and Paul went before and it was, you know, we were sort of jeans and T-shirt. We were fine in there and that was quite a warm, balmy day outside. Yeah. You know, we were watching The New Hope on the big screen outside. Obviously, you're down near the river there. Mm -hmm. So you've got, like, gnats and midges and stuff all, all in the air. And it was one of them sort of warm, humid summer evenings. And you're sitting there constantly, a massive crowd of people. And all you can hear every few seconds. Well, you know how when you watch the snooker on telly, you can always hear people in the crowd piping up coughing? Yeah. All you could hear amongst the crowd watching Star Wars was every now and then... <laughs> Obviously, there's another midge bit the dust or something. It was one of them sort of balmy days. But no, we were. You're, you're actually fine inside the convention centre yeah. there. It's it's quite well ventilated and air conditioned, and it's quite comfortable in there. So yeah. If not, I could go. Um, I could take my t-shirt, put it on my head, and go as the rancor keeper or something like that. Dengar. Yeah. <laughs> Cosplay. There might be some people asking for yeah. photographs. You never know. You never know. <laughs> um. Also, uh, we're go we're going to the London Film and Comic Con next month as well. When uh, you know, quite a few guests have been added. Uh, the Emperor is uh, himself is now attending, so uh, you know that that's quite a coup for a neighbouring sort of uh, conference. You know, and um, also Tobin Bell from um, Saw, he's going to be there and uh, announced yesterday. Uh, Avenger Jeremy Renner has been added as well. So they've got some good guests with Dolph Lundgren, Ron Perlman. Famke Janssen, Mads Mikkelsen, you know, it's going to be a good little show, I hope, so. Yeah, yeah, so, that's one of them films, if you watch it backwards, it's quite a heartwarming tale about amputees getting new limbs. Yeah, thank you, <laughs> I um, I used to live with a Kenyan lad in Poland, and uh, I I had a date come over, and sort of, she was quite attractive. What do you mean a date come over? Well, it's in my, my apartment. So, mail order or something? Well, you know. <laughs> Delivered. We, we arranged it, and she, she came and I, I cooked <laughs> for her, and uh, 
we, I had a selection of films that I've been probably lent at that time, and Saw was one of them. And uh, oh, great, it was great. Yeah, that a was. great date movie. But anyway, I popped it on, and uh, this um, this Kenyan guy Ben came came in, and he sat down for five minutes. He said, "Actually, I've seen this movie," and I was like, "Oh yeah, really? Is it any good?" Yes. He's not dead. And he pointed to the guy on the floor, which ruined the whole bloody film, didn't it? So, <laughs> anyway, it turned out the Polish kid had already seen the movie and we did other things. So, yeah. Worst date movie, I've, and this is dating me a little bit here, but the worst date movie I ever went to see was The First Wives Club. Mm -hmm. Bloody Goldie Horn and all that. Lot. I've never seen that film. Oh, the things you do for love, eh? Yeah. But, yeah. And, and did you enjoy it? No. No, it, it don't look like your cup of tea, to be honest. No. I don't know where I went wrong now, because I'm married to her today, but there you go. Well, someone went right. Maybe it was the perfect date. Did you have popcorn? I can't remember now. Mm. I'd had a few beers for going in. Oh, that much. Dutch courage. Yeah, Dutch courage. The trouble was it's making me feel sleepy because the film was so bad. <laughs> Anything else on housekeeping? That, that's people? about it. Uh, you know, thanks for, you know, for the uh, input from, from Jim and Yarek and, you know... We've got a good, good story coming up later, I believe. Yeah. And uh, another contribution. So. Well, I think we can we can acknowledge people as we wade through the through the through the podcast. Through the fen. Yeah, through the fen, through the black soil that is hot wampa, through these fertile stomping grounds. Anyway, shall we give uh, James's new piece of guitar music, John Williams' Wampa, a bit of an airing, and a bit of an airing then, and then head into Star Wars. Let plug in that amp. All right, hit it, James. Okay, Rogue One has been featured on the cover of Entertainment Weekly, which was dated June the 22nd. Big news that, I think, right? Uh-huh. It's, it's, I think predominantly it's to do with the fact that they've released 16 new photographs from, from the set, so to speak. Um, but they, they've also put an article up by um, their guy, Anthony Bresnikan. And uh, Paul posted it through to the Hot Wampa Facebook page. It's still there if you want to go back and have a look. We'll have a bit of a quick look at um, Mr. Bresnikan's article here. And he said, Before Luke fired the blast that detonated the Death Star, before Leah launched R2-D2 to a remote desert world with secret plans for that battle station. Someone had to locate and steal those schematics. Turns out it was a team effort. In this week's issue of Entertainment Weekly, we bring you an inside look at Rogue One, a Star Wars story, which explores just how the Rebellion came to possess the information that revealed the fatal flaw in the Empire's superweapon. It's a battlefield heist that fans have been imagining for nearly 40 years. Described in the opening crawl of 1977's original Star Wars with little details scattered throughout. The new film, from director Gareth Edwards, who's responsible for 2014's Godzilla, will finally fit those pieces together to form a full story, revealing never-before-seen characters while also reintroducing a few classic ones. We're confirming a big one on our cover, the galactic man in black himself, Darth Vader. Here's what else to expect from this week from EW's own peek at Lucasfilm's secret plans. The background of our cover showcase, new Imperial weaponry, weaponry being used against the nascent rebellion. Taller, slimmer walkers known as AT-ACTs hauling cargo. And a flatter fang-like interceptors known as TIE strikers. New information about Jin Erso, the theory of everything's Felicity Jones. The outlaw who has clashed with both the rebellion and the empire and now has a chance to clear her ledger of past wrongs by leading a mission for the good guys. It's also personal. Her father, played by Mads Mikkelsen, is a scientist whose knowledge is sought by both sides. Full details of the squad of characters uniting to take on the Empire, played by the most multicultural cast to appear in a Star Wars film yet. Diego Luna, Yang Wen, Donnie Yen, Riz Ahmed, Forrest Whitaker and Alan Tudyk as a performance capture droid. One of these has, seen, has been seen before by Star Wars fans. A look at the skullduggery inside the Imperial ranks is seen through the eyes of a new villain, Ben Mendelssohn's ambitious officer, who is eager to earn the favour of the Emperor and avoid the wraith of his black masked enforcer. Candid revelations from the filmmakers about what current reshoots are added to the story as the film nears its December release. 
Finally, confirmation of what fans had hoped ever since the project was announced. Vader is back. So that's what we've got from Entertainment Weekly. Yeah, some great images there. There's, a, there's one that looks like a tropical beach, isn't there? Yeah, I mean, I've got the images printed out in front of us now, so mm-hmm. we've got them yeah, as a right. reference. Um, yeah, I mean, this, this I, I think it was, a lot of this was filmed in the Maldives, wasn't it? Mm. And it certainly looks that sort of environment. Um, that, I mean, obviously, we've got sort of portrait images here of most of the cast. Um, some of it was pretty familiar. More like um, Felicity Jones there in the TIE Fighter pilot suit in the corridor. I mean, we've seen an image similar to that already, haven't we, yeah, in the trailer? Right. And Ben Mendelsohn and his uh, white get-up with a cloak, looking quite menacing. Yeah. Um, Forrest Whitaker looks a bit sort of weathered. He, look, he looks quite different there to the trailer, doesn't he? Mm. If you look at him there, his beard is longer, his hair's obviously grown out quite a bit. I mean, I, I don't know. Is perhaps there a flashback scene in this movie? or Could well be. Something like that. Is, um, there's a time element to it. Alan Tudyk's droid, we've got a picture of that. Which we- looks very scrawny. That thing's built like I am. It's all arms and legs, look at it. That that was spotted when it running down the um, Canary Wharf uh, <coughs> tube station, wasn't it, in the, in the trailer. So. Uh, oh right, I thought you meant for real. No, not for real, no. Packed full of commuters scratching the red as this thing comes yeah, flying past. Yeah, he'd forgotten his Oyster card and was doing a runner. <laughs> Come, we've all legged it down there when we've forgotten <laughs> the card. Why Alan Tudyk as a motion capture actor, do you think, when you've got the likes of Circus out there and people that are really well established in that art? I think he's done it before. Has he? Yeah, I think he. You know, he's done a few animated films as well, and you know, so his voice acting is pretty good. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. He's a fan favourite from things like Serenity and Firefly, isn't he? So uh, yeah, I know. I liked him in A Knight's Tale. You remember that film? He was good in that. No, I've not seen it. No. So so yeah, I th- I think he'll go- do a good job. What about these new darker armour stormtroopers? Is it Death Troopers? Death Troopers. Yeah, I think they're appearing in the uh, Battlefront game. Mm-hmm. On, on the um, yeah, on the Xbox I have got. There's an image of them here in sort of hills around the background. It looks like a, almost like a sort of dark soil basalt semi volcanic yeah. region, yeah. doesn't it? Like, it does. Could be you know like Iceland or somewhere like that. Sort of a sort of yeah, temperate sort of tundra type environment. Mm-hmm. And he's holding his hand what looks like a stormtrooper rag doll. Yeah, yeah, that's true. What is that? I don't know. Yeah. 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 It looks like a kid's toy. It does, yeah. Do you, do you think these death troopers, I mean, I think the concept behind them is that they're specialist shock troopers sent out to hunt down the various elements of the rebellion, that they're, they're perhaps hunting down a group here and this was an encampment where rebels or rebel families were residing or something like that and this is stuff that was left behind when they legged it. And they've had, they, the kids had like, um, yeah, stormtrooper toys. Mm. I mean, they look quite live as well. The Death Troopers, like their armor is a lot lighter. But mm. I mean, the the first, the guy in the front here, the the one that's holding what we assume is a stormtrooper rag doll, and then there's another Death Trooper sort of offset and stood behind them as in posture. That second one looks almost like sort of feminine in its build, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, we we know that they are they are using like different different heights, different uh, sexes, different types of creatures as stormtroopers these days, aren't they? They're not all generic, are they? No. So, yeah, I mean, that'd be interesting. I mean, I'm still a bit sceptical of the whole Death Trooper thing. I'm thinking action figures mm. and, uh, you know, a returned on merchandising. But it is nice to see some cooler-looking troopers. I mean, these guys are, are basically, you know, they're, they're like the, the sort of hardcore soldiers, <clears throat> by all accounts, that are being, you know, specifically used to target the rebel elements when they can find them, whereas the... The Imperial Stormtrooper, I guess, is just the generic infantry trooper of the Empire. So, yeah, and there's there's been a shot from most of the cast from the film. So I believe that's the Yavin Four base. Mm-hmm. There's a camera on the dolly and whatever you behind it. Stormtroopers, like you say, wading water and what looks like a tropical beach somewhere. That look, yeah, that's a good, a good shot. I like that one because when when we saw the trailer, you know, with the. Um the walkers attacking, that was kind of like a tropical background, wasn't it? Well, so that was almost like a beach-type environment, wasn't it? Like mm-hmm. somewhere that could be in the Maldives or possi- yeah. possibly Hawaii or somewhere like that sort of look to it. Um, <clears throat> why would they be treading water? There's so many death troopers in this last photograph. It's like they're storming ashore from something. Yeah, it, do- it does, yeah. You know, and this is going to add to that sort of whole sort of saving Private Ryan type feeling of the film perhaps well it? it's nice certainly nice to have some different locations isn't it you know mm. it's nice to have a beach like water rather than just sand 
thinking, well, I think you would have given up if we'd gone back oh. to Tatooine for Rogue One, wouldn't you? We still might, you never know. You know, I think you felt like um, Chaku was a bit close, which it was, in all fairness, mm. you know, it's it's an aesthetic we're used to seeing in Star Wars. But I think with this, perhaps they can take a few more risks like this. The only question I have, you know, these new troopers, they look really good, but what happened to them after Rogue One? Why didn't we see them in A New Hope, you know? Maybe they were like a special forces unit, a, a, a unit that was very small in scale anyway, and they were either disbanded or wiped out in Rogue One or something, I don't know. Like I said, it does sound like they're specific shock troops for a specific purpose, you know, like the SAS or something. You know, there's only about three or four hundred of them, but they're assigned specific roles. But I don't know. Yeah, it's some interesting sort of pictures, really. But the, um, they're all available, aren't they, on our Facebook page? With so yeah, the links to the Entertainment Weekly articles are all up there on our on our Facebook, like you say. Is Entertainment Weekly available in the UK? Can you buy it in a shop? I'm not honestly not sure. No, because it is an American publication, isn't it? Mm. So, yeah, I know Empire Magazine in the UK picked it up and they sort of borrowed the story, but this is coming straight from the source. So Yes, it's from Entertainment Weekly's own website, which I'm not a big fan of because there's so many different advertising hoardings and different links and stuff on there. I always find it takes an age to load on my computer. I was having yeah. some real problems pulling these images yesterday. But, yeah. So, well, there you go. It's a slightly closer look at Rogue One. I mean, I... I don't personally have anything else more Star Wars to you. Well, obviously Darth Vader confirmed, like you said. Um, no surprise there. Um, I, it was interesting what Paul said uh, recently about he's going to be a bit more nimble, you know, how they're going to do that, the costume maybe. He's going to be, you know, when, when we saw him fight Obi-Wan Kenobi in a, a New Hope, he was kind of a bit static, wasn't he? So mm. maybe we will see in this film, you know, he's a bit more... Yeah, he's like two old guys having a punch-up. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. You stole my Werther's Originals. Yeah. Um, another another Star Wars segment I've got is um, Lego The Force Awakens uh, game demo is available to play on PlayStation 4. So if you have a PlayStation 4, I don't think neither of us do, do we? No. But if you do and you enjoy it, please let us know. It looks quite fun, as all Lego games are. They're Didn't not... you get the uh, link up for that as well? On that's on Facebook? there, yeah. That's yeah. on our, our Facebook page as well. So if you want to have a look on that, look at the video. It is quite jolly and, you know, it's for kids mostly, isn't it? But mm. I know that they do sneak in a few important plot points in the, in these games as well, you know, just to keep them, you know, keep people on their toes. So. Yeah, well, you know, fans, they'll feed from it, so it, it attracts that interest, but, uh, yeah. What what are you expecting um, at this Star Wars Celebration, Dave? Is there, is there anything big that you think we should be looking forward to? Um, I mean, obviously, I'm on the mailing list for it because of, Obviously, booking the tickets online and stuff. I'm constantly um, getting emails through from the organisers saying this person's been confirmed, that person's now confirmed. Here's a floor plan, like you said, etc. Little tidbits that I kind of I'll get an email off on once a week, and it's kind of triples through bits and pieces. Um, I don't know really. I think just to go and generically enjoy it. I mean, obviously, any hot one for listeners that are there, and we think there might be a few. If you see us, um, come and say hello to us, have yep. a chat with us, uh, have a photograph taken. If you, well, we're not all really that famous, but <laughs> you never know. Uh, if you want to, give us a few words and we can record it and we can put you in the show because obviously we will be covering it to a degree on the show. Yeah. Um, but as for what I actually expect from it, um, I don't know really. There's a lot of booze get set up at celebration. Like we, when we went to the last one, there were a lot of independent artists that were selling Star Wars and sci-fi themed pieces that they had done and um, you know they did seem to a degree to be a corporate aspect to it but I think really it's what the other fans go as that really makes it yeah yeah you know, a lot of cosplayers will go that will be no part of the formal setup of the celebration but they'll go dressed as Dooku or as troopers or rebel pilots and stuff and um I, you know, I think that's amazing. You see some of the detail and some of the hours of work and stuff that people have put into costumes and armors and lightsabers, blasters, you name it. I Absolutely. like that kind of fan element of it. 
it adds to the day, doesn't it? I mean, even when you're queuing at these things and you're looking around you and you see people dressed up and you think, bloody hell, I want to I want a photo with that person later on, you know, if you can yeah. catch them again. And, yeah, and as you say, a lot of these people probably get a hotel room quite close to the venue mm-hmm. and, you know, they're getting ready early in the morning and sort of doing their makeup and sort of, you know, make finishing touches to the costumes and that. So that, that is, as, yeah, as you say, as, as good as meeting somebody famous or... Or seeing a vehicle or a droid, you know. It's that passion that never ceases to amaze me. I think we said on a podcast once before when me and Paul went, there was a, a guy from Japan, like a sort of older middle-aged guy, sort of, you know, late 50s to sort of early 60s type guy, um, with who had grey hair anyway. But he'd slicked it all back, more like Count Dooku, and he had the cape and the suit and the lightsaber. And he had two younger um, Japanese girls, with him, whether they were relatives or friends, or I'm not 100% certain, so I won't say. But one was done out like Padme, and the other one was um, all dressed up like Padme's handmaiden in, um, mm-hmm. is it Dormy? I can't remember yeah. that now. Uh, the one with Kira Knightley. Was yeah, it? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. What Each one was dressed as each one of those characters. And for some reason, they wanted a photograph taken with me and Paul. I have no idea what that is. <laughs> Perhaps they hadn't been approached already that much. I wish we'd gotten a photograph of them because they looked fantastic. But that's an example of the sort of fan love, I think, that really is nice at these conventions, that these people have put this effort into their costumes and they've probably bespoke to a degree. You know, they've made them themselves. They've come halfway across the planet and they're just there having a whale of a time and, you know, wanted the photographs taken with everyone. It's that sort of community feel, that attitude that people put so much into it like I said they come from so far and it's just a family and it's I just think it's wonderful seeing what people put in absolutely yeah, yeah. and um, I think you know the the uh, costumes that you can buy pre-packed some of them are pretty poor pretty poor quality and the material is pretty poor as well I remember seeing oh going, I hate that you go through the Argos catalogue you see yeah. like Darth Vader suit and, <laughs> and all this stuff and I I, I don't I don't know. I mean, I, I understand there's a market for it. It's merchandise. It's great for your kids that just want to run around in the garden smacking each other with sticks. You know, it doesn't matter if it gets ripped or torn. Kids will be kids. But, uh, yeah, I, I think it kind of cheapens it. But um, it's great when you go to these things. Like I say, you see the adult fans and, and the effort and work they put into these things. I saw a guy dressed as Jabba the Hutt, which was a bit disturbing, <laughs> which was uh, basically he was wearing a tent and it had a small like ventilation fan in it <laughs> to keep him cool. Because <laughs> I imagine it was quite hot, but it was a poor effort. Poor effort. <laughs> oh, well, we'll be getting onto a bit of local cosplay later. Won't yeah, we, we will. News. There's a good story coming up in that one. Speaking of, we don't have much on that, but I'm sure we can open that up a little bit more. Um, I don't know. I don't really have much more on Star Wars now. Do you? Not nothing more today. But I mean, obviously, keep an eye on our Facebook and Twitter. There's, there's going to be lots of news uh, coming in soon, isn't there? You know, these these new films are coming. You know, watch out for some spam as well, because um, yesterday was an episode eight trailer sort of leaked, but it wasn't an episode trailer at all. It was just um, you know, trying to get people to click on it. So it was clickbait. Yeah, I hate these fucking bullshitters around the internet. I really do. There's no need for that, is there? No, no. You know what I mean? I can see why they're doing it. And that's the annoying thing. We put out an honest product. <laughs> we can't be yeah, fucking no people to come by. Yeah. You know, there's no strings attached with us. Not really. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I said nothing more. In um, celebration, I'm looking forward to that aspect of it, of seeing what fans themselves have done and the effort and being amazed by that. Uh, some of the model-making stuff that goes on there. Um, the Vader's helmet competition thing they did last time had different designs on Vader's helmets with you know there's some things there that really come from left field you don't see coming that are amazing um, the R2 builders was good I mean I, it's one of the things I mean I could talk all day I mean I'm looking for obviously the slave layers um, you can never have too many of those um, I think the only thing I'm really not looking forward to is biker scouts They'll be looking for you, I think. They'll be like these death troopers. They'll be storming around the conventions. Coming somewhere. out of the Thames. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But no, I, no, that's what I'm looking forward to. So, yeah, that'd be good. Yeah. Yeah. It'd, okay. be, it'd be a nice experience. Should we let James play a bit more of James's jingle? Let's then, say another then? jingle all the way. We still ain't a hundred percent sure quite how we're gonna edit this to use this in future episodes. But yeah, it might, we'll certainly use it. But yeah, yeah, James, see us out then.
hockey religions and ancient weapons are no match for a good podcast at your side. You're listening to Hot Wampa. Okay, and with Yarrick's words there, we'll come into showcase. Wow. Robot and Frank, charming little film. I've yeah. only seen it for the first time this week, in the last few days actually. I rented it off iTunes, 99p, whether you rent it in standard definition or high definition, although for some reason I only rented the standard definition and it took me close to three hours to download yeah, it. Yeah, I remember you saying that's that's quite a long way. But um, it's worth it, you know, stick your iTunes on it, download in the background, and if you've not seen it, 99p, you won't be ripped off. I thoroughly enjoyed it for what it was. Um, but enough of that. Shall I give it a bit of a read-through, shall I? Robot and Frank is a 2012 American science fiction comedy drama film directed by Jake Schreier, is that? Yep. And written by Christopher Ford. Set in the near future, it focuses on Frank Weld, an ageing jewel thief, played by Frank Langella, whose son buys him a domestic robot. Resistant at first, Frank warms up to the robot when he realises he can use it to restart his career as a cat burglar. It was the first feature film for both Ford and Schreyer and received critical acclaim for its writing, production and acting. It won the Alfred P. Sloan Prize at the 2012 Sundance Film Festival, tying with the Kashmiri film Valley of Saints. The robot was created by Tony Gardner. It's Gardner Designers, his own special effects company, Alterian Incorporated. Plot of Robot and Frank, set in the near future, an ageing ex-convict and thief named Frank Weld, played by Frank Langella, lives alone and is experiencing increasingly serious mental deterioration and dementia. Frank's son, Hunter, played by James Marsden, an attorney with a family of his own, grows tired of making weekly visits to his father's home, but is reluctant to put his father into full-time care. So he purchases a robot companion, voiced by Peter Sarsgaard, which is programmed to provide Frank with therapeutic care including a fixed daily routine and cognitive enhancing activities like gardening. Initially wary of the robot's presence in his life, Frank warms up to the new companion when he realises the robot is not programmed to distinguish between legal recreational activities and criminal ones and can assist him in lockpicking. Together, the two commit a heist in order to win the affection of the local librarian Jennifer, played by Susan Sarandon. They steal an antique copy of Don Quixote from the library, which is being renovated and turned into a community centre in the wake of declining interest in print media. In the meantime, Frank's daughter Madison, played by Liv Tyler, who is away on a philanthropic trip to Turkmenistan, I hate these words, learns learns of the robot and returns to convince her father to get rid of the machine, which she finds ethically objectionable. Frank insists on keeping the robot and they commit one last heist stealing jewels from Jake, played by Jeremy Strong, the rich young developer at the head of the library renovation project. The police become involved and begin to question and monitor Frank, who maintains his innocence. Feigning deathly illness so that Hunter will return to see him in order to cover his tracks, Frank is faced with the decision of whether to wipe the memory of his robot even as, even as his own memory rapidly deteriorates. Frank's goes to the library where he discovers that Jennifer is his ex-wife, which he had forgotten. He then returns home where the robot convinces him to wipe its holographic memory. It argues that it is not a person and its sole reason for existence is to help Frank, which he can do best by helping him avoid jail. Frank is then sent to a brain centre where he receives help in coping with his dementia. The police do not recover the jewels that, as Frank implies in a note utter Hunter, are hidden under the tomato plants in the garden that the robots made. Good. In a nutshell. Yeah. Quite a, yeah, quite a decent sort of synopsis of it there. Yeah. Yeah, and um, I don't, I mean, I saw it, I can't remember if I was flying to Las Vegas or somewhere like that, but I remember seeing it on the 2012, plane. 2012, so four yeah. years ago. And I can just remember... um. I was I was quite teary. I think on the on the plane, which is always embarrassing when you're watching like a heartfelt film mm. and you're surrounded by other people, you know. But I thought it was really it really got me, and I don't know if it was to do with growing old or um, losing your memory, or you know. I mean, the, the Susan Sarandon ex wife thing. Okay, I think I saw that coming. I don't know if it was a shock, and I don't know if it really needed to be like that because it was already quite a heartfelt movie. So. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, what about you, that Dave? What did you think about it? I think the Susan Sarandon thing as well. I didn't really think it was effective or unnecessary. I mean, obviously there was that that sort of li- little nod. You know, she gets on with him quite easily anyway. She's always accepting a friend when he comes into the library. There's a reason why he constantly goes back to the library. Maybe it's his interest in literature. Maybe he was reading books during his time in mm-hmm. t- in jail. And she knows that about him, and that's how she ended up working in the library before dementia began to claim his memory and his cognitive abilities. Yeah. But a Frank, I think, is actually an intelligent individual. Yeah. He's capable of what he does. He knows his trade. He knows his craft. It's just his problem is his memory is it is given out with age, as it does with many people. I mean, perhaps that comes back to that poignancy that you mentioned, that, you know, we all get older. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. I mean, something I really enjoyed about this film were the locations which were at Ryan, New York, and Pearl River, New York, but really beautiful scenery. And, mm. and for a change, we've got a, a future film that isn't dystopian or, you know, it's it's like set in the near future. And, you know, it doesn't feel it's very bleak, apart from losing written words, you know. Yeah, but then there's perhaps, that, again, it comes back to the nostalgia about getting older. It's very rarely that people will sit today and read a newspaper or something like that and take their information from it. They'll go online or they'll, you know, watch documentaries or interact on interactive news services like Sky or BBC News 24. It's very rarely these days that people refer to media on a daily basis in the same way. Yeah, that's right. Um, financially, a budget of two and a half million, which is peanuts really today, yeah. it made three. Point three two five million something like that, which again is peanuts again today. Yeah, but it you know it made more money than it cost. It's a profit. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, let's have a quick look at the cast. Uh, Frank Langella, uh, Langella uh, the Mask of Zorro. He uh, he played Dracula, as we as we said, Skeletor in the Masters of the Universe film, which um, you know I've got good and bad memories of. <laughs> and um, Frost Nixon, which I thought was really good. I don't know if you've seen that one. I've seen Frost Nixon. Yeah. I can't think of it. It's Richard Nixon. He's Tricky Dicky, yeah. is he? And Michael Sheen is uh, David Frost. <laughs> David isn't? Frost, that's yeah. right, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, he's a really good actor, actually. Uh, he's in. Now you've said that, yeah, but for some reason it never really did. Perhaps I did think he played slightly too good a Nixon. That would be around the same time as this. Yeah, it? that's right. And, you know, maybe he was one of those... You can do a picture where you're going to get, you know, all the praise and perhaps a lot of money and a side love project that, you know, you can just do for a little, little amount of money and, you know, <clears throat> and he's probably done that. Um, James Marsden, I mean, he's never really hit the heights, has he? Um, right. Extreme Ghostbusters, he was in that. The Outer Limits, uh, obviously X-Men is probably best known for uh, as Cyclops. Um, and at the moment, he's, he's in Westworld, the TV series. West, West, is this the robot thing? Yeah, yeah. Why am I thinking of Yul Brynner going yeah, around? Yeah, shooting? exactly. That's the original Westworld. Exactly. And there is an, a new film of Westworld coming out and a, a TV series, whether they're connected at all, uh, other than by title. But he's in it, yeah. Yeah, the dangerous theme park made popular long before Jurassic Park. Mm. Um, yeah, but I mean, getting back to Robot and Frank, like you say, he's, um, the cast, I mean, we've got Liv Tyler there. Who we've seen in blockbusters, haven't we? We've seen her in a popcorn movie, Armageddon and stuff. Um, you know, Stephen Tyler's daughter. Yet this does feel feel like quite a small and independent nature movie for someone who's been a blockbuster actor to yeah. come to. To me, she's very. She plays the character very well. She's very breezy and sort of. And she's does, idealistic. Yeah, and she doesn't care too much about the world as such. She just wants to be living in it, doesn't she? And I mean, mm. you know. She believes the robot is unnecessary and you know immoral in a way that you know. But at the same time, both the kids are too busy to really take care of the father. Yeah. So you know, therefore, the robot is essential in his life. So. Well, that's the dilemma, isn't it? I mean, we as children, we grow up and lead our own lives, whether that be having a career and, a, and your own family, or going away like Liv Tyler's character Madison does. To do charity or work overseas, however that pans out. I mean, we have to go on and live our lives, and obviously that the duty of care to your elders, that sort of compassion that you want them to have something. Um, yeah, I mean, she's a bit idealist, but then again, uh, Frank Weld is like I said, his, his memory's going, but otherwise his marbles are still pretty sharp. 
he, at that stage he's starting to rely on the robot and he's warmed to the robot and he sees a practical application where he can use the robot to pull the heist which obviously he can't tell her about so she's trying to be all compassionate and idealistic knows the password etc etc turns his robot off at a stage when he really wants it back yeah he's partnering in crime sort of out of action which yeah is good. But there's a, also a bit that I believe in Frank Weld's character when he's talking to her and she's basically saying to him, well, why do you want it back, Danny? Why do you want it back? And he just says, he's my friend. And, you know, and I actually think Frank Weld's character, there's a bit of integrity in what he's saying there. He's not just a useful tool for this heist. He's not just useful for ironing his shirts and cooking his breakfast. He's actually, like, there is a warmth that's developed towards this robot that he likes having the robot around him the whole time. Yeah, you know, like you say, it's quite a poignant film about getting older. It is, yeah, and I like it. That it's under an hour and a half, which yeah, is very is unusual today. So. Manageable to watch. It was good for me this last week because I've had a few things on the go. So I was, like I said, I downloaded it on iTunes, put it across to me iPod, and I basically had it in my pocket and watched it when I could do in twenty and thirty minute instalments. And the film works fine like that. It's not so complex and not so long winded that you can't watch it that way and not follow it. Yeah. I think more than anything, it's a charming little tale. Yeah, it is, yeah. You know, it, you could say it would work very well to go straight to TV, but it's, I don't know, that would degenerate it in some way, I think, and make it seem more trashy than it is, because I, I, I think it's a lovely little film. The robot itself isn't the best-looking robot, is it, that we've seen on, on in <coughs> films? No. Um, played by a, a lady, actually, called um, Rachel Ma, mm-hmm. and she, she was in the costume... Um, also, she'd been in Birdman, Boardwalk Empire, and Gotham, but this was as a robot performer. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I guess there is a market for robot performers. Uh, the, the robot is actually a VGC60L. That's the serial code for the robot. Only gets named robot in the film, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it has no other name, does it? No, you'd have thought Frank would have given it a, you know. A, a partner in crime name. What, Buster or something? Something like that. Spike. Hey, Jake! Come on! Yeah. <coughs> um, the vehicle that passes Frank when he's walking down the road... That narrow thing. That's it. Uh, is an available production car. It's a Tango by Commuter Cars. Really? So that isn't... Yeah, that is out there somewhere. You could buy one of them. Oh, I don't know if I'd want to. Uh, it is a bit here. narrow. Yeah, mm. Good for driving down an alleyway or something. <laughs> Um, the free uh, the film reunites uh, Frank Langella with James Marsden for the third time, following Superman Returns and The Box. So that's quite interesting. Two completely different actors, but you know, been in three films together now. Mm-hmm. Um, over the closing credits, there's footage of real assisted living robots in various stages of development. That's right. Yeah. So I mean, uh, we haven't come as far as we probably had predicted, have we? Or robotics. Yeah, but it's not a, an exaggerated potential future, is it? No. I mean, he basically has like a big screen Skype in his living room to talk to his kids wherever they are around the world. That's a tangible technology. We can do that today. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he's, my hard drive's wearing here. I'm not happy about that. I think we're still recording. We'll keep going anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, apart from the, um, the, the, the car, the robot and the... Big Skype TV. I think that's the only futuristic sort of. Uh, but I think technology. the robot looks viable. I mean, these are the sort of things yeah. we see at sort of Japanese techno technical expos, isn't it? You see one kicking a football or swinging a golf club or something in right. a demonstration. It fit, feels like it fits that sort of aesthetic, that sort of genre. To me, it, it's an image I've already seen in news and documentaries and things popular culture. So it doesn't feel clumsy to me. It does feel viable when it says in the near future I think well this could be a conceivable near future it doesn't feel so far fetched and drawn out to me and I think the fact that hu- the film looks at a very human dilemma that is relevant now and probably always has been relevant you know there was a time when perhaps you know you had grandparents that were married one of them passed away I don't want to diminish it but the other one perhaps got a cat or a budgie or a goldfish or something for company and it, this is very sad I know um, I mean, my grandmother on my father's side when my grandfather on my father's side after he passed away she lived alone by herself and she probably went on to live for about another 15 years which so. is quite a, quite a good innings really because yeah. um, similar to you Dave um, my, I remember when my grandmother died um, she had like asthma and you know she was she weren't in the best of health but had all her marbles yeah. but when my 
when my grandmother died, my grandfather did everything for her, like prepare her breakfast, get the papers ready for bingo in the morning, mm-hmm. everything. Um, when she passed away, um, he's deteriorated quite quickly. Yeah, it's, you know? it's very strange. And she'd always seemed very sound and very sharp, like you say, all her marvels to me, as, as, as much as I could remember from her childhood. But after my grandfather had passed away... Um, she'd always been a little bit deaf throughout her life. She'd always had a hearing aid, and you know, we used to get towards the end of her life, it got to the stage we had to write stuff down because she couldn't physically hear what you were saying, so everything was being done on notes. She used to go around us, and the, the room was like full of postage notes on the on the mantelpiece, and on the sofa, and on the coffee table, you know, all her little reminders and stuff. It wasn't a memory, it's just that she couldn't hear. And I remember going around there, and after he'd passed away, she'd got herself a budgie for company, which she had in a little cage in the corner. And we used to go around there, just used to let myself in. Uh, we all had keys. There's no point ringing the doorbell and knocking on the door, because she couldn't hear it. So we would basically just let ourselves in and just go and see if she was okay. Mm-hmm. And of course, she wouldn't realise that you'd gone in there and were walking down the corridor to her living room, and she'd be in her living room with the door open and she'd be in there and she'd be talking to the budgie and she'd be having quite, you could hear her voice, like quite in-depth conversations with the budgie about what the weather was doing or, you know, things in life or she would recall times earlier in her life. And there were a few times when I, I mean, I'd only be about 15, 16 at the time, when I'd literally stop in the corridor and just listen to what she had to say to the budgie. And I know that's wrong in a way. It's almost like you're listening on yeah. somebody's private conversation. Not that the budgie was ever going to interact with <laughs> her. But I remember this budgie, she let it out of the cage to clean the cage or feed the budgie or change its cuttlefish or what have you. And it was on a hot day and she'd had the window open and it, it made a bowl for freedom and that was gone. And I remember she was totally gutted when she lost that. And it's bizarre, but that's almost what I thought about when Frank said about the robot that's his friend he's come to rely on that as a presence in his life to stop yeah. him feeling so lonely and she's used the password and gone and turned it off yeah you know and it, it is poignant that it is like a foothold in a way isn't it it keeps yes. it gives you something to hang on to and something else you know like, yeah you're right and if you're an old person and you're on your own all the day you've got the radio or the television to rely on you know mm. it's, it's nice to have something a bit more interactive yeah, yeah. which I mean obviously the robot would have been more than the bu- the budgie, probably been more useful. But um, you know, it, and I I don't know. Does is the robot solely following its programming? Is Frank smart enough to realise that he can work the robot in a certain way, or has the robot itself developed a sentient intelligence? Does the robot itself start to become Frank's friend? Does it start to realise in its own head that it's got to sort of sacrifice its own memories to protect Frank because its memory can be used as evidence against Frank? Mm. You know, Is there a, a bit of emotion and affection in the robot towards Frank or is it simply following a series of algorithms in its programming? Once again, it is that, you know, what is I it to be... open. Yeah, to be human in AI, you know, what is it, you know, to have a conscience? And... Mm. Um, but yeah, I, I think you're right, Dave. I think um, the robot does appear to sacrifice itself for the good of Frank. Yeah. And um, maybe, if, you know, the robot knows its purpose, why it's there to assist Frank. Mm. Frank has his own way that he wants the robot to assist him, which is criminal. But <laughs> <laughs> and the robot kind of thinks, well, that, that's, you know, well, that, that's this what is, I'm here Yeah, for. this is making you think, this is giving you enthusiasm, this is giving you drive and energy. And my, one of my roles is to keep you active and give you a ru- routine. So the robot seems to... F- view it that way and sort of follows the program doesn't it? I mean he, he's timing how long it takes the robot to pick a lock I also think with Frank and the robot because Frank obviously in his younger days had spent a lot of time in prison possibly away from his children when they were small possibly missed a big chunk of that father role as his children were growing up so I think in a way when he talks to the robot and he's teaching the robot how to pick a lock and you know, having his discourse. In a way, Frank's almost passing his learnings on to the robot. And I do think perhaps the robot is a, a surrogate stand-in for what his children would have been to Frank, that he would have had time in life where he could have taught his children things and spent time with his children. I do think he's the robot, for him, is helping him to claw some of that back. You know what I mean? Like Yeah, he, yeah, I agree. The first time in his life, bizarrely, he's a proper father. And obviously he's he wasn't able to teach his kids to pick locks and things like that, you know. No. It would have been immoral. But the robot is some some something it, he can, you know. It doesn't strictly have a sense of right and wrong in that. No, that's right. 
but I think you know I think that relationship between him and the robot is constantly charming throughout the film like the bit where he, he steals the guy's car drives mm. it around the back and the robot bundles in the back yeah. of the car they are like a double act yeah, aren't they yeah. you can't conceive of them being a team you know getting straight in wheels spinning off like you say I think it'd be right if the robot had some sort of criminal name Buster or Spike or something it would fit it wouldn't it <laughs> it would the way Frank works he's that sort of old school old fashioned criminal isn't he well, I guess this this confirms that Hunter is kind of right in providing the robot, because the change of diet, the um, you know the gardening aspect of it, I think it does improve uh, Frank's mental state, doesn't it? It does. He became it becomes more aware and sort of healthier in his mind. Possibly it gives him that routine, but the, like you say, the downside of that is once those. Once that grey matter is kicked in and energised and infused again, he starts thinking about right, what did I do well in my life? Yeah, he's I, back to his old old ways. What's the next job? Yeah, yeah. What am I good at? And then all of a sudden, the robot is a tool. It's an opportunity. But it's it's almost like um you know the robot is the student being taught from Frank like but where he's like a case in the joint and he's sitting there in the woods and he's got the binoculars up and the robot is stood next to him. And he's explaining to the robot, you know, how he's worked out their patterns and he's worked out their routines and how he's studying the locks and the security mechanisms as he's watching it to the place. And it's almost like there's a passing of the torch. Like I said, he, I mean, I, mean, I know father treats the, teaches the child to be a criminal, but it's almost like he's, in a surrogate way, is passing on what he knows how to do to, to, to something else, you yeah, know. Exactly, yeah. Um, yeah, the robot design was inspired by the Honda Asimo, which, mm-hmm. as you said, Dave, I think it's the one you see play football. Um, so a bit Lego-esque, isn't it? It's a bit blocky, you know, but, you know, that's that's robotics today. Mm. Um, the film was shot in just 20 days, so mm. maybe... Quite a low-budget film, eh? I think, in it, you can see that. I mean, some of the camera works... Most of it throughout, I was fine with. There's a few scenes, like, when the police are... A search in Frank's home and obviously people are in motion moving around the room and the camera work at that stage I did find a little bit shaky mm-hmm. on some of the scenes it's a bit like the old sort of handheld feeling to it or well, most of it was obviously shot on dollies and tripods um, yeah I mean it, 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 it does feel to me like it's got a low budget and there's no reason why a film which is quite a simple tale like this has to have a big budget um, like you said, I think it's more about the performance and the story and the poignancy and the message that it puts across and the questions that it asks. But that sort of ob- obvious low budget aspect to it didn't deter me. I just sat there and I watched it and I enjoyed it for what it was. Good. Star Wars reference. He doesn't like you. I don't like you either. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, um, Frank says she in this one. But mm. yeah. And yeah, I mean. It's a wonderful, heartwarming tale, and as, as I said, poignant. You know, as Dave mentioned, yeah, it's about getting old, holding on to what you got, and you know, and finding someone else who maybe will infuse you a bit more in your later later years in life. You know, possibly. I mean, that's what the robot is. It's Sudoku. <laughs> it is. Yeah. Do. Yeah. Um, I mean, at the end, I think there's a there's quite a cruel. It's a happy ending in a way because he's. He goes to that home and he, he acknowledges he's got his family now and he's in a care home and we have to assume that whatever was left of Frank's life is relatively happy and comfortable and that his family will for at last dedicate the time to Frank that he needs. I think he does need someone to keep him on the straight and narrow anyway because yeah. he's like a kid when he gets bored the trouble starts. But there's that really sad bit and it, and it really comes to... to to discussions of memory and whether the robot is intelligent and will the robot even be remembered obviously the robot has a has a memory um, that can be used against Frank in a in a court of law and the robot has been party and accomplice to everything Frank's done so it can but it, it can drop Frank in it can't it it can indict him and that was such a poignant scene and we'll use it for the specific cover up on this episode when Frank and the robot are in his bedroom and they're facing each other and the robot says, look, makes Frank aware of this and says, your only option is to wipe my memory and he tells him how to do it. It's the switch on his back. And it's that moment when Frank pauses because Frank's memory isn't that short. He's considering intelligently what the robot says and he's reluctant to do it. The robot has become a being in his life and it, like you say, it's quite, it's quite a heart 
wrench in an emotional moment and he reaches around the back of the robot and the button comes out and he presses the button to wipe the robot's memory and the character is gone but it is almost like he's embracing the robot his friend there in that moment and it's quite gutting it is and obviously with Frank's own memory problems you know Mm. seeing how he could quickly erase a robot's memory like that perhaps it makes him think well you know what about myself you know how quickly is you know have I lost my memory Mm. you know yeah, so that's a poignant scene. He he loses what's become a friend in that moment. Then he goes on to into the care home, and there's the scene in the care home when he stops and pauses, and there's other residents of that care home that are sort of work, walking around this care home with these their own domestic robots. I mean, we have to assume this place in the near future that the sort of homemade robot isn't so far fetched, and that you know a bit like the short mobility buggy, probably one in so many old people have their own robot. And we see the other residents of the care home walking around with the robot. And Frank stops and pauses and he looks at them. And it's like a deja vu moment. It's like that's triggered something in Frank's memory about his own robot. Yeah. Do you think perhaps at that stage that his memory is deteriorated so bad he's forgotten the robot? But he stops there and that makes it, it seems familiar. I think there is, yeah, that familiarity is there. I don't think he's thinking... I can use this robot to help me, you know. I don't, yeah, I think you're right, Dave. I think perhaps he's already forgotten his own robot, but there's that little nudge in his memory that it seems something about that, you know, is it's not so foreign to him. There's something in his mind that's recalling that, yeah, yeah, I think you're right. And I think perhaps there's a bit of a poignant irony in the end there as well that he wipes the robot's memory, but then because of his own mental degeneration, his memory of the robot has gone. Yeah. So the the two kind of come together in that way, don't they? Exactly, yeah. And I think that is... When I watch this film, I, I always think about myself. And it, it does you make... You said this about getting yeah, older. And get, stuff, it? it sort of re- makes you reflect and think, well, will I be in that situation one day? I'm not, not having a robot, of course, that would be lovely, but, I mean, just about your family and friends and things that you lose... As we get older, you know, when when you think of things like Alzheimer's disease and stuff like that, you know, which horrible, really, you know, to to lose the memories and memories are who we are in in a way, aren't they? You know, we can have as many Facebook photos and you know videos and photo albums as we want, but what we got upstairs is the most important thing, really. Well, that's what defines your character, and and no binary file, ones and zeros, pixels on a screen. Is always there, isn't it? I mean, a, a photograph or a song or a sound, it's not always expressive. But what, like you say, what runs in your mind, what's most important to you as a being, it, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's quite a deep, weighty topic, really. It is, Dave. I mean, and I thought we were going to have a, <laughs> a jolly, upbeat one. <laughs> oh, we, we'll, get, we'll get some. But there is some lighter moments in this. Yeah. I like the sort of miserable old bastard aspect of Frank. That you so said resistant. that, didn't you? you? You said, as long as he's a grumpy bastard, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> he's so resistant to the robot as well. That thing's got to murder me in my sleep. It's a typical old person's attitude to a piece of technology that they yeah. don't understand, don't they? Yeah. I mean, obviously, he soon cottons on how he can use it. Like I said, Frank's marbles, might, his memory might be going, but his marbles are still damn sharp, aren't they? Yeah. He's like a sort of typical old person person that can misbehave and not give a shit well, i like frank yeah, I I do, yeah he's expected his his cereal i mean he's gotten used to eating like a junky cereal a, a cereal with a lot of sugars and stuff like that every day that's part of his routine he probably don't give a shit and clear his bowls up or anything he lives in the fucking pigsty <laughs> and then you've got robot brings him these like grapefruit or whatever it is yeah and bloody um all, all different types of beans and pak choy and Healthy it, stuff. Uh, yeah, bring, brings him his grapefruit. Then today we're going to start a garden, Frank. And he's like, well, fuck this. <laughs> <laughs> he's so, such a grumpy old bastard that's so resistant to this presence coming into his life. That, I don't know, for some reason, people that are dry and a bit acidic like that, I always like them. I always find I can laugh at them and laugh with them. You know, there's a lot of character in that. I know there's no social grace to it, but I always think oh, that's quite rich and individual. Yeah, you know exactly. I mean? Yeah. And there's a part of me that thinks that will probably be me one day. That someone will, I mean, I'm not sort of backwards in technology, as you well know, but someone will bring you something that's so far out that I'm so unfamiliar with and it's something I'll look on as a modern trend and I'll just be completely resistant and reluctant to it and not adopt it at all. Do you know what I mean? I, I absolutely, yeah. I think, uh, and I don't know, is that is that the bridge? Do we realise then that we're getting older, you know? 
have we crossed that bridge already is there technology today that you you you, you know you can't get a grasp of I don't know. I think not really. No, and I think our generation are quite fortunate that we've grown up and we've seen so many changes that we we still embrace them today, don't we? I think because a lot of I mean we grew up on the threshold of the digital age. I mean we often talk about the eight bit computers and mm-hmm. what have you that we had as kids playing Renegade and stuff like that on, and we've gotten through today. I mean how much more sophisticated have computers become? in the transition from our own childhood to where we are now in our lives as sort of established adults. It's come such a long way. That's been the digital revolution. I mean, tomorrow's world got it wrong. We looked at the robots on tomorrow's world and you had something that looked like an arm with a sort of an entire, something like the Enigma machine of yeah. who is programming it, made out of Meccano, dropping a sugar lump in a cup of coffee and this was how wonderful the future was well robotics has come on significantly further from that yeah. and we're now talking about AIs and algorithms and stuff computing power has come on so massively in our lifetimes tomorrow's world got it so wrong we should have been according to them wearing baker foil suits living on colonies on the far side of the moon well it's not that our technology hasn't evolved it's that people didn't quite see the direction that the technology was going to evolve and that's been the digital revolution and it, and and it has been much smaller out. much smaller hasn't it much more intimate much more yes it home. fits our life more easy yeah. we've tailored it to suit us in a way that's practical to us the smartphone or your iPod or your tablet or your iPad what have you the, the digital elements that we live by fit in your pocket or they fit in your bag or you can chuck them in your love glove box in your mm-hmm. car. Your car hasn't changed that much. No. Cars were about being driven around when we were kids. Cars yeah. about, we drive cars about today. The world physically hasn't changed, but this digital aspect of it really has shot forward ahead of everything else. And maybe it's because we look at the world and the world doesn't physically look that different that we adapt to it. There's only something we see that as a small change, despite that small change, is in fact a massive thing. Yeah. You know, so the, the way we've gone forward, I think we've been more accepting. Whereas with my dad, who comes from a very analog time, you know, the world's simple, he understands things to the way they worked when he was a kid and when he grew up and be- became a young adult. Simply programming something like a VHS player back in the day was a nightmare I think it would have been easier teaching a caveman how to ride a push bike because to him that was so far removed to him you couldn't record something unless you pressed record and play the concept of setting a time and having this thing then switch itself on record something and switch itself off programming was so far out to my dad he didn't understand that and I think when there's a, a big jump of something that's completely different we adapt very poorly because technology has been, fits into our lives, we've tailored it to fit to us. For us, I don't think it's so awkward. No. Frank, on the other hand, is an old-fashioned criminal. He's a lock-picking man, wears his balaclava, his woolly hat, his dark gear, breaks into homes, like, sort of, you know, grabs his swag. I mean, you look in his safe and he's got stuff there. He's got soap and stuff, for God's sake. That he's yeah. Licking. It's stuff that he doesn't really he's need to He's just shoplifted. Yeah, low value goods. You know what I mean? He's a very old world individual, and all of a sudden he's got this thing that he has been resistant to, like my dad's VHS, plonked on him, and his attitude towards it, oh, fuck out, I'm not even interested in it. <laughs> it's exactly the same look my dad gives me when I try to explain to him about the internet, or why don't you look for your car insurance online instead of getting the agent to come around sitting at the kitchen table and going through it and exchanging cash for your car insurance. I go online, I'm done in 10 minutes, get my quotes in, and he looks at me like I'm talking Swahili. Yeah. Well, my dad is like Frank in that regard. There's this world that he do- he's not familiar with and he's not comfortable with, and it's seeing that relationship. You know, my dad wouldn't say that I sit there and say, oh, fuck this, but I'm sure he's said it in his mind a few times and given up on the modern world. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and yeah. I, I, mem- I remember my parents like living in Hong Kong, which is obviously you know high on technology. Mm. Getting getting the iPhones uh, each, and mum, my mum was like, "Oh, look, I've got this phone," you know. And I said to her, "Look, it's great having it, but you've got to know how to use it. Mm. People are going to try to contact you, and not just phoning you, but sending you messages or voicemails, yes. things like that. You've got to know how to access them, and you know." Most modern smartphones, you can Skype or use Yahoo Messenger. There's mm-hmm. a ver- FaceTime. There's a variety of ways to communicate that I think we've adapted to probably quite well that for our parents' generation who are used to picking a phone up, running the finger through the dial and actually, you know, physically putting the number in and talking to someone at the other end. 
I mean, take my dad again, you know, he's getting on close to 80 now, but to him, a telephone would be something you picked up and asked the operator to change the cables at the other end and put you through. Wow, yeah. And look where he's come to in his yeah. lifetime. Yet, he, there were still cars about when he was a kid, there were still houses, roads, aeroplanes. The physical world hasn't changed massively, but this other part of it, media and techno digital world, has changed immensely, and it's just too far for him to get his head around. For us, I don't think it's been so bad. No. And and when we look at our grandparents, you know, the, the times that changed then you yeah. know, significantly, whereas compared to ours, it's a, it's a slow transition, you know, to what? To, you know, in 20 years' time? I don't know. What are we going to have? Frank, I also think, has got an old kicking and screaming. Mm. We all have to get old. It's a part of the journey of life we go through. There's nothing you can do about it. It's going to happen. Um... And we all have to go through that sort of transition. And, you know, it, there's a part of Frank that I think is reluctant to go through that transition. And, you know, like, like I said, basically just accept the world as it is. Yeah. And he, he gets quite bad tempered about that. But I like that. I think it's character. I like Frank. Yeah, I, I like Frank. One day I will be Frank. Someone will put something into my life that's so far removed from what I know that I'll just be completely reluctant and. No, I'll fuck off. I'm not interested in that <laughs> attitude. That's Frank. And I'll, one day I'll be Frank. I'm certain I'll be Frank. Well, that'd probably be me with you when you're trying to push me out of that aeroplane when we were 90, mate. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Bloody hell, yeah. <laughs> fuck off. If you want to go, go ahead and do we're it. We're going to do a parachute jump when we're 90, aren't we? Yeah. Lovely. Uh, with a robot. I'll push that out without one. Well, we'll certainly go down quicker with the robot, I think. Mean. Yeah. <laughs> probably weighs a few. Yeah, well, robot and Frank. I think we we we've, we've covered that well, you know. As it, it does bring out feelings in you, and you will feel a bit sad. Yeah. At the same time, optimistic. The robot, you know, the technology and the friendship. There is a is a well covered aspect of the film. I think. Yeah. You know. Um, and it's available, as Dave said, for as little as ninety nine p to rent. And uh, absolute bargain. You're not going to lose anything by paying ninety nine p to watch Robot no. and Frank. And I think you'll sit there and you will enjoy it, and you will find it both sad in some ways heartwarming in others you'll find it humorous the film has got so much character to it yes it deals with a, a perception of the near future that near future is not too far-fetched and i think it's just a very nice human story and i think yeah. it doesn't matter who you are you can follow and enjoy that i think it's a charming little film yeah that's just really as much as i can say about it to be honest yeah i agree totally agree with you dave yeah yeah Give it a score, what would you give it? I would say seven and a half, something like that. Yeah. yeah? Is there any reason why you wouldn't... I mean, I don't think you'd hold a prejudice on the basis of its low budget or anything. No, nothing like that. I just think um, maybe a little sentimental towards the end. Right. But yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed it. A lot of things I enjoy about it, you know. Yeah? Yeah, it's not sort of... Uh, it's not going to pull up many trees in the award ceremonies, but I mean, at the same time... If you want a heartfelt, yeah, you know, heartfelt story, sit down and watch it, and then, you know. That probably come in around the same mark. Yeah, around seven and a half to eight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I said, it's not overly complex. It's it's straightforward. Anyone can follow it, but it's a lovely, charming film. And an hour and a half. It's got its place for you on a flight. It's an ideal yep, movie because it's not so complex to follow, but it's not so. It doesn't talk down to you. You know, it doesn't insult your intelligence. It's a great little movie for that package. Uh, I don't watch movies on flights because the first time I went on a long haul flight was 12 hours to China and they put Groundhog Day on and then they put Groundhog Day on again Are you and then kidding? In, in a loop really yes. so I don't watch films on planes based on that trauma so, attack someone had a joke there I think yes very much so mm. not only that I got sick on a flight as well I had these dodgy little plastic bottles of red wine that I had with a dodgy prawn curry thing they were serving as an in flight meal and that all ended up down in the uh, in the aircraft latrine so wow. yeah yeah, it would have been, I mean, something like Robot and Frank, I think would have been a much better introduction to yeah. the in-flight entertainment experience. Well, I mean, nowadays, most of the uh, airlines have those uh, multi-choice film things, don't they? You yeah, have, this like, was 50... back in the early 90s, mate. Yeah. You know what I mean? You, you you watch what they put up sort of thing. But, uh, yeah, I, never, I think the aircraft itself was pretty built in the 60s, looked out, sort of aluminium burnished wings. There was a panel thing that looked like it was going to flat and come off the wing the whole flight over. Yeah, not the most best experience. It like sounds like um, Bill Murray wasn't the right person to get me through it. Let's no. put it that way. 
It sounds like um, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom kind of thing, you know, they close the door and off you go. Yeah, it's like looking for a dinghy to jump yeah. up the hatch with. <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you what, if I, I mean, we've talked about the Twilight Zone recently in the episode with the gremlin thing on the yeah. aircraft's wing. I'll tell you what, if the gremlin landed on the wing of that aircraft, it wouldn't have to do much to fuck it up. It'd just like, fall it off. It'd fall apart at any moment anyway. The engines was like shaking about on the pylons and stuff, yeah. But yeah, no, fairly charming little film. 99p to watch it you won't lose anything and I think you'll completely and thoroughly enjoy it yeah so, exactly. yeah but yeah not really much more Robot and Frank no should we get on to some local skullduggery I know you've got some good stories this week so I'm looking forward to this we've got some yeah pretty cool stuff um, really it's a case of letting Jim take us in again here we go here we go <laughs> episode 30 local news this one ironically hot wampers own house guitarist James sent our way so thanks for that James it originally came from the Cam's Times newspaper dated 18th of June 2016 from their correspondent John Elworthy volunteers from Finland Animal Rescue went to the aid of a peacock stranded on a Friday bridge rooftop the group says it sprung into action after receiving reports about a male peacock that had turned up out of the blue. None of the residents knew where this bird had come from or anything about a potential owner in the area, said a spokesman. The reports had been coming in for the past few weeks and we have attended the scene multiple times but have been unable to catch the illusion peacock, I don't know what makes it an illusion, until last night. The bird is now safe in our care. But now we need your help in finding out where this bird has wandered from. Joshua Flanagan, who set up the charity a year ago, told the BBC, It was rather weird and wonderful animal to find on your roof. Helped by two colleagues, they used ropes to bring the peacock to safety. He put up a bit of a fight and definitely didn't want to move, he said. The peacock has been recovering well at the charity's Whittlesea Rehabilitation Centre and is almost back to a normal weight. All attempts to find his owner have so far failed. Fenland Animal Rescue sounds like fucking Thunderbirds or yeah. something. Says anyone who knows where this peacock has come from or has any information at all that may lead us to an owner, is there going to be a reward for this? Then please do not hesitate to get in contact. The group has its own Facebook page and relies on donations to keep going. Currently they are seeking donations from supporters and loyal businesses of prizes to be used in their tombola stalls when attending events throughout the county. Go to Facebook to find out Finland Animal Rescue or via Twitter at Finland Animal Res- Finland Rescue. Sorry, what do you think? Peacock on the roof. If was, I was it in danger? Man. Yeah, I mean, why why was it up there? I mean, can peacocks fly? They can fly, but like they must do. It got up there somehow. Yeah, they're quite heavy, aren't they? Um, well, this one was a little bit underweight by all accounts, but down the Jennings Arms, they used to have uh, peacocks. It's, oh, is that? Jenna's Arms. Is that the end of Ten Mile Bank? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, I know where you are. Near now. Denver. Denver, yeah. yeah. They used to have uh, peacocks wandering around. And what, uh, just hacking about in the garden? Yeah. And um, where I used to live down Ten Mile Bank, my neighbour had a peacock called Charlie. And, uh, yeah, they're quite, <laughs> yeah, quite a large bird. I don't, I don't think... It, obviously, that one's probably long gone by now. But, yeah. you know, down there, there are quite a lot of peacocks about, so... Well, yeah, it's not the sort of thing you come out and expect to see on your rooftop, is no, it? No, no. Nobody has obviously come in. Mean, I'm sure if somebody had lost a peacock, they'd be aware that they'd lost a peacock. I wouldn't know where you would buy a peacock. I don't know. Peacock purchasing shop, I don't get them online. Where do they come from naturally? Is it Sri Lanka or somewhere yeah, like that? Yeah, yeah, that, that kind of South South India, that, you know... Sort of Indian Ocean yeah, subcontinent type area. Yeah, so they're around there. Somewhere like that. I don't know. I, it's not something you expect to see. Beautiful birds, though, aren't they? I mean, gorgeous birds. I mean, uh, there's a male peacock, so it's one of the ones that's sort of more colour, the cock bird, not the hen. Yeah. Uh, so it's sort of more flamboyant with the brighter colours and would display those colours, obviously. As it is in the, in the bird kingdom. Yeah, that's, that's the way they behave, isn't it? Um, I don't know. 
be a bit of a feather in a cap for this charity to be called out to a... It is a bit of a bizarre thing, though. I mean, you don't come out expect to see a peacock on your roof. Well, we, we, we've had uh, saltwater crocodile skulls salt recently. Water, and Perhaps it was him. Yeah, perhaps, perhaps it was his next victim and it got away from good luck to him. Beautiful plumage. Yeah. Well, well hopefully, if it is an escapee as such, uh, an owner can, can be tracked down and it can be returned to its home. I mean, Surely they can't get too far, you know... I don't know. I had it in my head for some reason they were a bit like the Kiwi, that they couldn't fly, but obviously they can. They can fly, yeah, but not just short distance. You know, like a pheasant. Yeah. Yeah, they don't fly like long distances. So they sort of fly fast and low to the ground yeah. and, yeah. you know, certain times you mate and see pheasants. I mean, we see pheasants in the field, don't we? Especially the mm-hmm. male birds, the, the cock, they're sort of red, brighter colours. We'll see them out in the middle of a plough field sort of certain times of year during the mating season and... Typically, that tends to be when they get run over and hit by traffic because they're out there with one thing on their mind. We've all been there. Um, do you think perhaps that's what it was for this peacock? Yeah, it could be on on a little adventure looking for a lady friend. You didn't have a lot of luck, did you? You didn't no. find some on the roof. I mean, there's peacocks. <laughs> another night on the tiles. Yeah, another night on the town. They ended up, uh, do you know where it all went wrong? I got drunk and I ended up on his house roof. <laughs> I don't know. Perhaps it'd come from where my nan's budgie went to. I have no idea, but... What happened to that budgie, Dave? That, that's been... Never found, mate. No. No. Because obviously they can survive in the wild. There's this uh, park somewhere down in London where there's like some bright green parrots that live, isn't there? Yeah, you see parakeets in like um, St. James's Park, quite close to Buckingham Palace. Um, yeah, Regent's Park as well. Uh, wallabies as well in Hertfordshire. So, Is it really? Yeah, there's, you know... There's a lot of animals that have sort of made their home there. Like we said about the mink locally, you know, there are minks down near Roswell Pit, you know, brought yeah. over for the fur trade. Uh, let go by idealistic animal rights campaigners into yeah. an ecosystem that has no natural predators or natural way of managing them. Mm-hmm. And now they're wreck fucking havoc, basically. You know, they natives, sort of stoats and otters and things like that, they'll, they'll take their territories and they'll prey on their young and... Um, I understand people's idealism that it's cruel to farm an animal for fur and to a degree I, I agree with that because it's not a necessity, it's a luxury in the case of mink fur isn't it? Um, there's no need to sort of battery farm them and mistreat them and do that um, but I do think people need to be a bit more responsible when releasing something about the environment it's going to be released into. Well look at San Francisco with Caesar's gang. You know. Exactly, this yeah. is where it can all go wrong you know. Or the Xander in our own rivers mm. competing with the native pike and the perch for, yeah. as a as a as a predator to there. I mean, the introduced into the lakes of uh, Woburn Abbey. Yeah, it's, and when it's been released into isolated waterways yeah. and it's got no predator itself. Nothing's going to eat one of them. Spikes on his back, and look how hard the damn thing looks. A oh, pike yeah. won't touch it. No, no. So you know they've run rampant through the sort of native roach and bream and trout stocks and caused a lot of problems, haven't they? There's some big ones in the ewes as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I remember catching Xander quite frequently, but I've never caught a pike or what have you once or twice. Mm. You know, but um, people need to be a bit responsible about what they release like that and think think of the great ramifications of what they're doing. I think, but it's certainly a bit bizarre to find a peacock on the roof. And let's let's hope it works out well for the peacock. Obviously, we'll try to keep informed about the peacock and uh, keep people advised. A good call, the peacock. I don't know if you have you heard a peacock. No, no. no. It, it, you remember Lenny Henry when he used to do that uh, radio show in the cupboard? And you, you remember? Oh, on the Lenny Henry show. Yeah, and, and crucial to... that time. <laughs> that's it. Yeah, that, that's. Oh like... no, that was the African guy, wasn't it? Gadanga. Yeah. What was his name? Hello, the my friends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's a peacock. I think the pheasant is a difficult one to replicate, isn't it? Because. It... <coughs> oh, I don't know. Anyway, let's get off um, the avian theme here. Um, this one's from a spotted on any Facebook post on the 23rd of June 2016, which was, what was the last Thursday. This is from Richard. We don't know who Richard is. I have put the call out to see if, if someone can track down Richard. We can get an interview with Richard. Uh, I suppose spotted on any you have to respect people's anonymity yep. as much as we do. Yeah. Uh, but if anyone knows who Richard is and if Richard's prepared to talk to us, then please get in touch. Richard said, so I saw Chewbacca casually strolling around Ely Market today carrying a polling card. Somebody else took a photograph of him later on where he was spotted on a bench with a briefcase drinking a tinny. Have you seen both images? Yeah, I have, yeah. So you know what I'm looking at? Yep. It's a, it's a guy, um, he's slight, I don't know whether he's got a cushion down the front, but he's a little bit portly, walking around in an adult-sized Chewbacca onesie in Ely Marketplace. 
initially spotted with his um, polling card in hand and later on spotted sitting on a bench with a briefcase and tinny. Do you know where that bench is, Mark? Let's have a look. The benchmark. The benchmark. Yeah, I couldn't. I'm looking at the building. Yeah, the it's near the Minster Tavern and the Cathedral Education Centre. What used to be the library. That's right. Around yeah. near the Palace Green. Yeah. Which is quite a vibrant and busy area of a lot of people up there, especially this time of year when it's warm. So Chewy must have been seen by quite a few people. Yeah. In his onesie. I mean, what do we think about this guy? I mean, I've never worn a onesie. I can understand that they're, you know, they're quite popular. I know you can buy them in Primark for you know, 10, 15 quid, and people like to sleep in them, but to actually go really? out, yeah, I think in the winter they're quite good for, uh, you know, keeping warm, but to actually go out in the, you know, it wasn't a cold day, it was, you know, it was quite mild, wasn't it? <laughs> and he's gone out to vote in his bloody Chewbacca onesie, I, I don't know. I, I mean, the guy has a polling card, so we obviously, we've got to consider he's someone who's considered sound of minds. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, so we're assuming he hasn't escaped from somewhere. Or one, flew over, yeah. one flew over the cuckoo's nest or yeah. something like that. I don't know. Do you think he was spotted later on with a with a briefcase with a tinny on it, drinking, watching the world go by? He sounds like a model professional. <laughs> he's, got his, he's got his briefcase out, yeah. Well, he does. He's the guy, the, I don't know. We look at the guy. There's no reason to assume he's an unrational person, but he's walking around in a Chewbacca onesie in Ely. Uh, how much can I just have a look? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, he's got a nice little stroll, as, as uh, Richard says. He does look confident, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah. Polling card in hand, taking the world in, a day out. I don't know. What is he drinking now? Oh, it looks like Iron Brew. You think it's Iron Brew as opposed to anything alcoholic? It might be, yeah. I don't know. I think this was a bet. I think someone said to him, I'll buy you, or I'll get you a pint in, or I'll do whatever, if you go out and vote in a Chewbacca onesie, and he's done it. I've seen some, yeah, I've seen some sites. Yesterday, I saw a woman uh, with a dress with, like, uh, the Welsh, Irish, Northern Irish, Scottish, and English flags all over it, just covered in it, you know, so some people do wear some strange things to vote. I mean, it's almost as bad as the Comic Cons, I think, these days, with cosplayers going to vote. Do you think this is what it's like a sort of Lord John such loony yeah, yeah. monster? Because they always go out in the sort of beige suit with the cowboy hat, and don't they? They always look the same, don't they, when they vote? Either that or he was locked out, and that was the only thing he had in his car that he could put on. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't think anyone approached him and asked him what he's doing, but as we know, it's not wise to upset a Wookiee. Never, yeah, never upset a Wookiee. And this gentleman, while he does look a bit poor, he does look the sort of person that possibly could handle himself, so... <laughs> Well, if you you know if you see him, uh, we've got the p- photos on our Facebook page. Yes, yes, please do approach him, but be be cautious. Be cautious, yeah. And like we said, it's not wise to upset a Wookiee. Don't upset him. Um, but yeah, I mean, let you know, let us know if you see Chewy around Ely anymore, casually strolling around, because it is a bit of a mystery. Um, you know, let us know. Nothing more on that really. Um, the last one we've got. Okay, can you remember in Hot Wombat episode twenty eight, we talked about the naked bike ride event due at that's that right. time to yeah. be staged in Cambridge. This was pre it being staged, obviously. Obviously, it's been staged since you were in Cambridge that day. That day, yeah. I don't know what you got to bear witness to. I um, saw a few, um, yeah, nude cyclists uh, coming past. Yeah, mm. and Is it, 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 it was a bit moist as well. So yeah. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because um, fortunately, or with the tale I'm about to tell our listeners, unfortunately, possibly, for us Hot Wampa listener David Powell was driving through Cambridge on the day it was staged and he's been able to provide us with a field report upon witnessing the event. Now we need to read this report out. This isn't a report for the faint-hearted. Uh, Dave has been quite colourful and graphic in describing the vision that he saw here. As he always is, I think so. And uh, we've already talked a little bit about ageing in podcasting, and I think some of the physical effects of ageing are going to be quite graphically described here. So Dave, um, we're not going to edit this too much. I think it's, uh, it's good enough as it is. You can tell he's a blogger. Uh, so we'll, we'll give his, his his little field report, these, and I'll weigh a bit of a read-through. You know how sometimes you see something so ridiculous... So gobsmacking, so dumbfounding that your brain can't process what it thinks it just saw. Well, yeah, that. Stuck in traffic down Trumpington Street in Cambridge last week, I saw something that horrified, amused, confused and offended me all rolled into one. I was busy talking to the wife about how much I'd rather gouge out my own eyeballs with a rusty teaspoon than go back to that free-for-all clothes shop Primark when my wife uncharacteristically stopped talking. I clicked my fingers next to my ear just to confirm that I hadn't gone deaf, 
which thankfully turned out not to be the case. On the opposite side of the road, I noticed what had stopped her in her tracks. It was something large and flesh-coloured, pictured a shaved grizzly bear with gleaming wheels growing out of its arse, and you're not far from what I bore witness to. I figured it was just some crazy old man that had forgotten to get dressed. But from behind its considerable, considerable bulk appeared another flesh sack on wheels with breasts that were so saggy the nipples were in danger of getting caught in the bike's chain. There were so many helmets on show, but not... <laughs> <laughs> Fuck's sake, but not a single one of them was being worn on the revs for protection. It was bizarrely mesmerising watching a hundred or so naked people cycle past. Balls bouncing free in the breeze and bum cheeks so whether they looked like an antique leather satchel. As more and more of them slowly potted past, I became acutely aware that I was staring. This was not cool, so I went out my phone and proceeded to take a few thankfully blurry images. I love the fact that he says that he fa- he's thankful that they're blurry, but he got the phone yeah, out to them yeah. anyway. Of this highly unusual spectacle. To be fair, I'm not even sure what they were doing it for. Maybe they were just hot. Maybe they were campaigning for cyclist awareness or maybe they just all had recently escaped from the basement of the local asylum. All I know is the one fit lass that cycled past completely stark has got me a dirty look, a punch in the ribs and a night on the sofa. So I thought I'd share it with the Hot Wampa lads and their listeners as it was relevant to one of their recent podcasts. Next time, can you please give me a reporting job that involves models in bikinis that aren't older than the Battle of Hastings? Brilliant. Now, Dave... Has complained about Primark before, hasn't he? I yeah. remember him blogging about Primark. So I, it's quite. Dave's he, already Frank. Yeah, he is Frank. Yeah, <laughs> he must have been annoyed already because I remember him being angry about Primark and then sitting in traffic. It's just sort of wound him up a bit more, hasn't it? Yeah, it was a hot day, and then all of a sudden this vision comes cycling past. I can understand the trauma of it to a degree. Definitely. Yeah. Um. I mean, we, obviously we can't commentate on the state of Dave's marriage but he said that actually made his wife go <laughs> yeah and a punch in the ribs and a night punch on the sofa night on the sofa uh, we've all been there um, yeah so what do we think of Dave's report you were in Cambridge on the day yep did you witness this trauma unfolding as well? I saw several, yeah. And it's always worrying whether they are part of that crowd or just doing it as a, a leisure activity. You mean like a flash mob? Yeah. People would see this, get the kit off, quickly yeah, in a hurry. join in. Yeah, grab a local bike and then just off. I, I couldn't do it, Dave. I don't know about you, but sitting on a bicycle seat is, is a pain in the arse anyway, let alone naked. Bloody hell. It does sound like, you know, the, this this wasn't the cast of Baywatch that was cycling no. around Cambridge. This no. was... um. Well, quite, quite potentially a traumatic site. Well, as Cambridge doesn't have a nude, nudist beach, this is probably the next best activity, you know, get on a bike. <laughs> oh, dear. Well, next year we'll be ready, perhaps. I don't know. Perhaps we'll be there with a wide lens. What, waiting for them? Yeah. Like an ambush? Yeah. No, I don't want to. I'd much rather talk about it in this context than bear witness to it. <laughs> if people <laughs> want to send us a field report like Dave has, that's completely up to him. But I don't, I don't, I don't want to be exposed to this trauma. We could be in flesh-coloured wet onesies. Like, like Chewy? At, yeah, looking as if we were why, we are naked, but actually not. No, we could do, yeah. Have a little sort of... um fig leaf or something stitched on the front of it yeah. Adam and Eve yeah maybe Paul could get a tent outside the Fitzwilliam Museum and we could all hide in there yeah it could do but yeah I mean I don't know it's, um, I'm sure other people witnessed this as well and uh, I think Dave did have forewarning that this was coming from us so I don't think he was too surprised I wonder if he looked on that checked his listened to what we had to say checked his calendar and said right I'll go to Cambridge yeah fancy Primark today love yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. normally he's reluctant as hell to go yeah. to Primark it's like a minutiae society he doesn't want to be there and, uh, no we'll, we'll get in there today uh, thanks for that Dave I mean, it was quite yeah, rather cheers, humorously uh, written um, an insight to your thought process and what was going on as you witnessed this what did you think did you have students with you at the time yeah but I think we expected it and uh, you know we were kind of jovially you know pointing fingers as as well as other things and then uh, we went down to the 
Reverend got on a punt because it was the safest way no, to I'll avoid... No, it's those students. Yeah, 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 the same ones, yeah. Oh, no wonder they were a smile on the face. They're probably some dying from laughter. Well, I thought it was because they were with me, but obviously now I'm, I'm sort of re-evaluating that. What were they, Italian or Spanish? Uh, one Italian and three Spanish girls, yeah. Right, would they have this sort of thing going on at home? Is uh, this an unusual concept to them? I or? think so, yeah. I think it would be alien to, to most of the Spanish or Italians, yeah. Really? But, we, you know, we're quite eccentric in Britain, aren't we? We like to get a kit off. Get a meat and two veg out. Mm. Yeah. Um, I don't know. That, that did make me wince a bit when you said about getting your nipples it caught in a chain. Yeah. Whew, that'd be it comes cool. back to aging again. We'll be doing it soon. Yeah. <laughs> We're all going south. Yeah. Oh dear. On your bike. <laughs> but I don't know. Well, I don't know if I'd have gone quiet. I'd have probably died laughing. Mm. But that's the way my sense of humour works. Would I have wound down the window and had a comment? Would I have been white van man in that instance? Would you? I don't think I don't think I would comment. I think I'd just be like gobsmacked. I think you know, <laughs> just seeing a multitude of naked people on bikes. Well, it doesn't sound like it was all a horror show. Like you said there's one fit last that cycled past, um, but I didn't end too well for Dave, obviously. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think it's really harmful to be honest with you. Um, people did notice it. I don't know, really. Interesting to get a field report in. Yeah, thanks for that. Yeah. Uh, not much more really in local news, unless you've got any local points you want to discuss. Well, I was... Um, a couple of weeks ago, I was knocked off my bike. Yeah, you were, weren't <laughs> yeah, you? Yeah, I think I'll, bring, I'll just bring that to the table. What, what happened... Um, were you I, naked? I wasn't naked, fortunately. I'd have a few more grazes. Um, powering along on your push bike like a you know your legs going like yeah. pistons with your meat and veg out there in the uh, slipstream got falling off like Buster Gonad you know managing to bounce down the road <laughs> but I was just down um, I was coming back from Cambridge I had my lights on I was fairly visible you know and um, it was about 9 o'clock as you know it's still quite quite light at that time this was in Ely yeah it was in Ely yeah right. it was just outside the uh, St John's one stop okay and I was cycling past <laughs> At like two metres from a guy who opened his car door. Right. I smashed into the car door and went flying over the top and ended up on the... Literally the heat, over the top of over it? The, yeah. And How I ended fast up were the, you going? Not, not that fast, mate. Not, is his door like crumpled? Is it still, you know... It was. It was a... Was it a Vauxhall Tigra? Is it a Tigra? Right. Is it still wrapped around the handlebars of the, your bike from the impact? I was lying on the floor looking up and the guy was saying, I can't, I can't shut my door. <laughs> And I was thinking, I can't move my arm. <laughs> Did he get arsy with you at all? Did he get difficult? It was all right. It was all right. Um, thankfully, a neighbour came and sort of grabbed the bike and said, you know. Because really, he was in the wrong here. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't have avoided it. There was no way. You, if out. you're going to open the door on the road, you, you look in your mirror, you look over your shoulder, you make sure no traffic's coming along before you yeah. open your car door, exercise a bit of common sense. Uh, treat all the traffic the same. It doesn't matter if it's a car or if it's Mark powering along with his legs like going on pistons on his push bike. If it hits you at speed, it's going to do damage and you could hurt somebody who, frankly, doesn't deserve it and yeah. ask for it. I was hungry, Dave. That's right. Maybe I was going more fast than normal. I know, but all the same, the guy should have checked. Yeah, he should. You know what I mean? Yeah. You shouldn't just sort of open your door on a busy road. That's not <laughs> good sense anyway, is it? Maybe he would have done it more if it was a na- naked cyclist, you know. Oh God, that would have been a scene, wouldn't yeah, it? Yeah, it would have. Oh, bro, I don't know. Yeah. But do be careful, and cyclists obviously avoid uh, getting too close to doors when you're passing. You know what I'm well, yeah, but then, then it's no different to driving past. You shouldn't have to give it that extra room, should you? I mean, it's whoever's in the car's prerogative to look out and make sure it's safe to open the door. Mm. I mean, this person, no, they don't think it was malicious. They probably no. didn't realise. No. If it had been a car, it would have done a lot more damage to their car, obviously. It's probably more serious in the sense that it was a cyclist that you weren't protected. And like you said, you ended up over the door and on the road. I mean, it's not it's not good, is it? I mean, people need to be a little bit more aware. Should it come down, really, that people having to ride through Cambridge traumatising Dave on a, on a weekend just to get the point across about cycling safety, should it? I wouldn't want them to get their point across, mate. <laughs> <laughs> not on that crossbar. <laughs> oh, dear. But yeah, I mean, so I mean, I don't really have any other local rantage. I'm trying to think at the moment what other stuff that's going on. Nothing else. That's it for me from local news. I'm sure we're gonna compile some more for the next one. Episode yeah. thirty-one. Yeah, it's been a bit slow, but we might. Well, so Paul's Paul's been away camping, which kind of 
keeps Star Wars down to a bit, and obviously his, his, his input is missed. He is the hot wamper bear, bear grills, really, isn't he? He is. He, he likes that sort of outdoor lifestyle, but you know, to a degree, I don't blame him. Really, mm. if you can do, I think we'd all do it. I certainly will. I'll be out and about a lot more. But yeah, um, really, then that's it. Episode thirty. That's it, guys. Yeah. An hour and thirty-two minutes plus added audio. That's where we are. Well, thanks for all the contributors today. You know. Yeah, we've had quite a bit today. Um, that's like it. Probably a more lower key episode than usual. Uh, there's a fair bit of fucking expletive in this episode. Whether I bleep it or whether we just let it go. I let it know. go. Let it go. Yeah, I'm frozen. Our, le- our listeners tend to like a bit of swearing now and then. Don't yeah, they? Stephen Warhouse will like this one. So yeah, fuck it, we'll just. Put it <laughs> it so there's your warning uh, at the end of it. Once we've already sworn to you the whole way through it. Um, yeah, that's it. Episode thirty-one. Hot bumper. Yeah, what will we do then for 31? Um, 31, episode 30, you're hot one, but I said I'm getting ahead of myself now. It's you talking about ageing, I'm already in the fortnight's time. I feel like I aged after a night down the Minster last night. Well, yeah, uh, boy, you had a bit of a run right there anyway, didn't you? I did, um, but the thing is, now with the football on, at the moment, the Euros, you know, you stay for one match and then you realise the next one's about to start and yeah, you yeah. go, oh, I'll just stay for one more. Yeah, yeah, so. well, why not? We know you had a few more beers and Tempest Flare, the heat gets up and all the rest of it. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So for episode 31, I don't know. Uh, whatever's going on with Star Wars, I think we need to perhaps look a bit forward, a bit more to Celebration Europe of that coming up when we're getting a lot of information coming through about who's coming and what's happening there. Maybe we can focus on that. Uh, local news is up to the local area. People doing silly things. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'll always have something to talk about. Really, just leave Showcase open. Well, I'm sure you've got a, a few ideas, and Paul, you know, let's let's find out what he would like to do. So, oh, you know what we'll do? We'll sort it out in the messenger chat, but about yeah. a week in advance, like we always do. Just yeah. chuck something out there. Robot and Frank kind of came a bit out of the blue. Yeah, I've never seen it, but yeah, thoroughly enjoyed it. Lovely little film. Um, I don't know if our listeners want us to do anything, as long as it's not too far out. Send it in. No votes. No, no votes. Um, we're not having a poll again. Not after that last debacle. <laughs> We are doing the original B movie, The Daily Earth, is still at some point now. And I'm sure we'll do the sequel to uh, Planet of the Apes, Rise of Planet of the Apes. Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. Yeah, yeah I think that needs its space a little bit. Um, so, yeah. Did you see the sequel for the new Tar- That sequel, sorry, trailer for the new Tarzan thing? I did, yeah. Don't um, you think the, the apes in that look a bit sort of animated and rendered a bit like the Rise and Dawn of the Planet of the Apes apes? I think they have to be. You know, that's that's the benchmark, isn't it? It's motion capture again. Yeah, it has to be. Any less, you know, it, people would be disappointed now. It does look better than CGI render, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Motion capture, it does work. I quite like it. But yeah, so that's where we are. So if anyone's got any showcase suggestions they'd like to send us, then send them in. Whatever, mm-hmm. really. Yep. Can't say anything more than that. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. Uh, have we got any music to play out on? I'm sure you'll find something. I might just let Yarrick talk us out. We've not heard from him in so long, have we? No. All right. So that was episode 30. Episode 31's coming up with whatever in a fortnight. Take care and we'll see you soon. Hot Wampa. They mostly come at night. Mostly. <laughs> <laughs>